please join me in wel welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Judith Lean. Okay, you guys, no heckling. <laughs> okay, so thank you all for coming um, to hear me talk about what I think of as our home in space. Uh, the images that I showed at the beginning were all of the sun and the earth, but taken from the earth. And this is a really beautiful image. Um, and it's Carl Sagan sort of calls this the blue dot. This is us. And it's taken from, from the... Um, the Voyager spacecraft, and it shows, this is us, this is where we are, and this is a sunbeam. So I shame, shamelessly stole his words here uh, to, to give the title of my talk, Suspended in a Sunbeam. And so what I want to talk about is uh, what we know now about the Earth, our home, like you think of your home as, you know, maybe Irvine or the planet or whatever, but really, we live in this system of the solar system, and we really are suspended in a sunbeam. And so I'm going to talk about um, the sun-earth system in general. So maybe by the end of my talk, you'll get a sense that it's a system that is our home. And then, in particular, about how that home and the environment in which we live is changing, but not just at the surface. I'm going to start with the outer reaches of the atmosphere where satellites orbit, and then talk about the ozone layer a bit closer to home, and then talk about the very controversial topic of climate change and what role in particular does the sun have in all those things. And having established that, then I want to talk a little bit about the future because that's a really important issue for everybody. So um, I tried to make an image that shows the sun and the earth to scale, and, the, and you can't see it. I had to shrink it down so much. So this is the Earth. But we can blow it up. And this is just to let you know that literally the Sun and the Earth are two bodies that radiate to space. And space is cold. The Sun is about 6,000 Kelvin, so it's much hotter than the Earth. Its distribution of radiation is different. It peaks in the visible. It heats the Earth with that radiation, hence suspended in a sunbeam. And the Earth then um, radiates itself to space. Um, because it's cooler, it radiates more at infrared wavelengths. But it's the balance of the incoming radiation from the sun and the outgoing radiation from the Earth that literally establishes um, the temperature and the environment in which we live. Now, these are uh, images of the sun and the Earth that you're probably all very familiar with. This is the surface of the Earth, and here's the sun with a sunspot. But, but both these bodies, the sun and the earth, have their own atmospheres that extend out from the surface. So here are other images of the sun and the earth that you might not have be so familiar with. This is the outer atmosphere of the sun. As you go up from the surface, there are all these spheres, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. This is the corona, the outer layer of the sun that's very hot, about a million degrees. And it sends photons at different wavelengths to the earth. And so this is an image of the outer atmosphere of the Earth, actually taken by an NRL sci Naval Research Lab scientist, which is where I work, on the, with a camera on the moon. And you can see the atmosphere of the Earth. This is in the vicinity of where satellites orbit. It's literally glowing with uh, reflected and emitted light. And the Earth, too, has spheres. The troposphere is the lower atmosphere sort of surrounding us where we live. We go up a bit higher to the stratosphere, and that's where the ozone layer is, and I'm going to talk about that. And then we get up to this region called the thermosphere. Thermosphere, because it's hot. You can see the temperature of the Earth above about 100 kilometers is much hotter than at the surface. So you can see the, the situation is very complex. And in fact, it's even more complex than that, because when I put all that together, here's the sun, here are the photons coming to the surface of the Earth, Here's the surrounding atmosphere, the thermosphere and the ionosphere. The ionosphere is literally the ions um, produced by radiation embedded in the thermosphere. And all of that surrounds the Earth, which itself is embedded in the magnetosphere. Now, the magnetosphere is, results from the fact that the Earth has um, a magnetic field. The sun not only produces photons, hence the suspended in a sunbeam, but the outer atmosphere of the sun can sometimes erupt 
and produce what are called coronal mass ejections because they come from the corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun. And it's a plasma that smashes into the Earth and literally deforms the magnetic field. So you can see this whole system is very complicated and very in interactive. And it's, it's a wonderful challenge to understand how it varies and why. Now, these are some examples of how the different regions are changing. I'm going to talk about them in more detail, but to start, if we look above 100 kilometres, and for reference, satellites such as the space station orbit around, say, 400 kilometres. And here's the range in temperature that you experience uh, at that region. And this is just an image of the Earth. All these dots are satellites. We have over 20,000 objects in space and, and maybe um, 1,000 of them active. This is the electrons in that atmosphere. Just think of it as a time series showing you how this part of the Earth's environment is changing. And you think that, well, here's the surface of space and between, you know, you, your cell phone and a satellite, there's nothing, but there is. There's this ionosphere, this plasma here, and this affects our environment. Now, here's another picture. This is the ozone layer, and looking, moving down now in altitude, this is a layer that exists about 20 kilometres, and here's the time series of the total ozone in a column over the globe, and it, you can see it's really not changing. Similarly to this, it's a different time series altogether. And here is the thing that probably everyone's familiar with, the global surface temperature. So this is the temperature of the Earth. So these are three different time series showing three different regimes of our home in space. And you can see they're all different. And I'm going to talk about each of them because each of them is influenced by different things. And understanding this mix is really important to understanding the extended environment. And in particular, because the sun drives much of the Earth's... Well, it, the sun establishes the Earth's temperature and it drives much of the variability in the outer atmosphere. So we need to know um, how the sun affects the environment in which we live. Now, there are multiple timescales of solar variability. It's not just a constant sun. And we know this from many observations. It has an 11-year cycle. It rotates on its axis. So here is an example of the 11-year cycle. The sunspot number that you're probably all familiar with um, shows this. The active regions, these bright regions on the sun are called active regions, and the sun rotates on its axis every 27 days. And so here we are at Earth. Oh, sorry. Here we are at Earth, and, we're, and these bright regions on the sun are literally circling around and beaming bright amounts of energy at us. Um, and, and the sunspots do the same thing. But on even shorter scales, these um, bright regions can erupt. So there are eruptive events. So you can see there's a whole range of time scales that the sun is varying. And that's sort of forcing the environment, the broad extended environment in which we live. So that means we need to understand how the sun's brightness is changing. And just for reference, the energy that actually comes to the surface was once called the solar constant because everyone believed or hoped that it would be constant. But it isn't constant and it changes. So I'm going to talk about that. But that's just part of the issue of the sun's changing brightness. These are images going from the surface of the sun here. And here I've shown sunspots um, on the surface of the sun. And you can see, you think they're small on the surface of the sun. But in comparison to Earth, they're big. So this is really a big system we're talking about. So this is the surface of the sun. It's called the photosphere because photo means light. It's where the light that reaches Earth comes from, visible radiation. Here's the chromosphere going up, and here's the corona. And you can see from the minimum to the maximum of the solar cycle, there are big changes. And that's because the sun has an activity cycle. It's typical of middle-aged stars, which is what the sun is, about four and a half billion years old. And these activity cycles produce changes in brightness. So the sun, being about 6,000 Kelvin, has a black body spectrum that peaks in the visible. So this blue curve, it's actually a log plot, shows the maximum radiation in the visible, um, tending off to the infrared, emission in the ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Interestingly enough, is not part of the black body spectrum. It's emitted from the outer layers. This green curve here shows you the variability of those different regions. So in other words, 
you think, well, the sun has a spectrum. Yes, it has a spectrum. Every different wavelength of that spectrum varies differently, as shown by that green curve. And more importantly for Earth, the Earth receives different amounts of radiation from the sun at different altitudes in the Earth's atmosphere. And that's because the Earth itself has an atmosphere. That atmosphere is cons consists of gases that absorb the sun's radiation. So the visible radiation that's the peak of the black body curve essentially comes uninterrupted to the surface. So when I talk about climate change and the role of the sun, this is the channel I'll be talking about. The ultraviolet part of the spectrum penetrates down to the stratosphere and it actually creates the ozone layer. And then the higher energy radiation um, is what heats the thermosphere. Now, if we didn't have this atmosphere and this ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet high energy radiation was able to penetrate to the surface, then we wouldn't be here because all of this part of the radiation spectrum is biologically damaging. So what I'm going to do, the way I've organized this talk, I'm going to start with what we call space weather and space climate. In other words, the space environment above about 100 kilometers where satellites orbit, where the ionosphere exists, which alters the transmissions that, the, of the radio waves that affect our cell phones. I'm going to talk about that first because the sun has a dominant impact on that part of the region. And you might think that's a long way from home, but in fact, our technology now that we use, you know, we use satellites for navigation, for transmission, for communication, it's part of our extended operational environment. That's, that's the Navy term, the extended operational environment. And so I'm going to start there, and then I'm going to talk about the ozone layer, which is sort of in between, and then I'll talk about climate. Okay, so the thermosphere, or this outer layer of the atmosphere where satellites orbit, orbits is hot because the energy from the sun at the extreme ultraviolet wavelengths heats it. It literally is absorbed here above 100 kilometers and as the sun goes through its cycle, here's the time series of that part of the radiation and you can see how it affects, in this case, the Yoko satellite. So a satellite launched in 1992, moderate solar activity, the sun's activity decreased. The satellite orbit stayed about constant because the thermosphere wasn't very warm. The sun's activity heated up. The density, the, 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 sun, the sun's activity heats up and the density just sort of expands out. So a satellite in that orbit experiences a more dense atmosphere and that's more drag on the satellite. And poor old Yoko, you can see, did a rapid re-entry and that's because of the sun heating the outer atmosphere. And, and this variation is occurring on time scales of days because the sun's rotating on its axis. So you can imagine that all of these many thousands of objects in space are feeling this variable impact, this variable heating and density. And in fact, you think, well, you know, that's really interesting, but it's a practical issue now because there are over 20,000, I think the number is now 22,000 resident space objects. You don't think of that, but all this is us here. And in low Earth orbit, these are all of those objects, including the space station, which is one of them. And actually, the, the recent um, collisions and explosion of space objects um, has been increasing that so dramatically that it's become really important to know how the sun varies, how it affects the density, and how it affects the orbits of these spacecraft. So this has become a very practical issue. Another practical issue about this outer atmosphere space environment is the fact that the energy from the sun, the extreme ultraviolet energy, has enough energy to break apart the molecular oxygen and nitrogen atoms that exist there. So you can see a photon comes in, it creates... Um, it, it, it causes the um, molecular atom to ionize and produces electrons. So what you see here is the net effect of that. It's the time series that I showed you earlier, the total electron content in the atmosphere. So it's all the electrons that the sun has produced in the atmosphere. And it's a big blob because literally this is the sun rotating over the Earth or the Earth rotating under the sun. So above us is this plasma sphere that just keeps going on created by the sun. And as the sun goes through its, its cycle, its activity cycle, that amount of plasma decreases. And in fact, all the amateur radio astronomers really like to know 
what's the sunspot number? And, and that's really what they're saying is, tell me what the extreme ultraviolet radiation is because that's affecting the ionosphere and my radio communications. Now, here I've just broken down for that time series that I showed you initially, the total electron content. In other words, think of it as the amount or the strength of the ionosphere. The solar component here in blue it dominates this part of the ionosphere. But like all regions of the atmosphere, this also has internal variability. And here are oscillations um, with amplitudes at semi-annual and annual timescales. And this is, it's more complicated than just relating to the orbit of the Earth around the sun, but it's related to that. In other words, the whole sun Earth system is geometrically moving with respect to each other as well. So you can see here, for example, the trend, such as it's there, it's probably not even significant, is minor, you know, a few total electron content units compared to 40 that the sun is producing. So that's the outer atmosphere, and you can see that the sun literally dominates that. And on shorter time scales, even still, now, the sun can have eruptions, uh, and you've probably seen some of the beautiful images from... Uh, of these eruptions. And this is a, a, a diagram that illustrates an eruption from the sun heading to Earth. I'll have a drink while it does it. Here it reaches, remember the Earth's magnetic field smashes into the upwind part of the magnetosphere. This is the extended tail of the magnetosphere. Reconnection occurs. In other words, these magnetic field lines get all jumbled up. And so the particles that they contain get disturbed and they get channeled down into the poles of the Earth following the magnetic field lines and produce aurora. So the sun, the eruptive events from the sun, produce aurora. And on the way to the Earth, they interfere terribly with some of our instruments. So here's an, this is actually taken by um, an instrument built by the Naval Research Lab. Here's the sun. Here is a massive coronal mass ejection coming out from the sun. Here's that same instrument eight hours later. It was totally, the detector was totally destroyed. I mean, it recovered, but all those particles from that sun literally saturated the detector. And one thing to point out here, these particles events take about eight hours. So this is the sort of blowing in the wind, solar wind connection. The photons take eight minutes. So these time scales of just connectivity are also different. So the energy comes in to the Earth's um, poles, creates an aurora. And what does that do? It's an input of energy on very short time scales. It heats the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, which then rises because it's hot. It sort of fountains over the poles, spins around to the day side, and alters the temperature and the composition of the atmosphere. So in addition to the regular photons and the solar cycle and the solar rotation, we also have the sun going through eruptions. So all of this is affecting the entire space environment. And you can see here, these are just blow-ups of the time series, big changes in the density. It actually decreases the total electron content and increases the density. So multiple timescales of variability. And this is of, of such interest to um, a lot of people, actually, that um, the, it's very popular interest. An astronomy magazine recently had an interesting look. They call it our crazy sun. You know, the sun isn't crazy. It's like, we're just crazy for thinking it's stable. But how solar storms could shut down Earth. Okay, so this, this was in astronomy magazine. This one is my favourite. This was... <laughs> This was here on the front page of the business section of the Washington Post, the business section, right? When space weather attacks, like everyone's, oh my God, the a solar storm's coming. But this was a serious article. In fact, here is the article, when space weather attacks. And it literally went through what I just said, but pointed out that a sufficiently big storm could disrupt, disrupt navigation, disrupt communication, and a whole variety of things. And here I've I've put what, when we brief programs, like I work at the Naval Research Lab, and you say, well, the Navy, don't they do ships? Why are they interested in space? Well, the Navy is actually the biggest user of space. And I can't tell you why, because I don't know, but they do a lot of stuff in space. <laughs> and so the things that are, so this is the, the extent of the extended operational environment. 
communications on the move, all sorts of intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, missile detection, a whole host of things happen and are affected by that environment. So this is very much part of our reality. It's part of our security, our economy, and it's very much part of our home. So that's a space environment. So now I want to move on to the ozone layer. Well, that wasn't meant to be funny. What was... Okay, so good. You like the space environment. So now the ozone layer. A whole different issue about our planet, and I'm sure everyone here knows that the ozone layer is disappearing on the trailer. Where is it? I can't see it. Well, actually, you can't see ozone. You can smell it. But, but it, it's been disappearing uh, because of human-related chlorofluorocarbons, which are things in things like spray cans that humans in, um, emit into the atmosphere. So now I've been talking. This is the space weather regime above about 100 kilometres out to 1,000 kilometres. Now we're talking about the ozone layer that resides in what's called the stratosphere. And to, to, to show you a little bit more about that, first of all, as we go up from the Earth's surface, we don't have that much ozone at the surface. And in fact, ozone is a pollutant at the surface. But as we go higher in the atmosphere, the ozone layer peaks. And the reason we have an ozone layer is because of the sun. So here is the sun. We're now talking about the ultraviolet radiation, which is less than about um, 300 nanometers or 0.3 micron. That's what produces ozone. It dissociates molecular oxygen, thereby producing an atom of oxygen. The atom then re of oxygen then recombines with the molecule to produce ozone. So there's this cycle. And in fact, the UV radiation also destroys ozone. So we have this nice cycle here where most of the sun's radiation is going to the surface, and I'll talk about that next when I talk about climate. But this very critical ultraviolet radiation in the region 100 to 300 nanometers is producing the ozone layer. Well, it also produces the things, the chlorofluorocarbon molecules that destroy ozone. So what I'm talking about here is freons, things like freons. It used, it's called, I think at one point it was called the spray can war. And there was this funny thing I read. Um, if I get a spray can, um, I use it as a deodorant and that gives me skin cancer. Some this short circuit connection of what really is happening is that the spray cans have things called freons, which are inert in, in the troposphere. They know, that's why they're so wonderful. They're also used for refrigeration, um, cleansing agents. They're inert, they drift up into the stratosphere, you know, around 20 kilometres, and there they get hit by the ultraviolet radiation, which dissociates um, the big, long chlorofluorocarbon chains to produce things like chlorine, um, fluorine, and things that destroy ozone catalytically. So now the sun produces ozone and it produces the things that destroy it. The sun isn't the only thing that affects ozone. If we have a big volcano, for example, like El Chichon and Pinatubo, volcanoes that produce um, um, gases that reach up to very high into the stratosphere, then this can also affect ozone in the following way. We get a lot of um, sulfur dioxide, it forms sulfuric acid, this layer of basically um, ga different gases helps um, change the energy balance and it helps destroy ozone. And I'm showing you this because the sun is not the only thing that's affecting ozone. I will show you the sun creates ozone, it causes it to vary, but so do volca volcanic activity and man-made things. And so here's, here's an example of trying to put all that together. What I'm showing you now is the temperature at 19 kilometres. So here we are at the surface. As we go up from the surface, I'm sure you know when you're in an aeroplane, um, it's colder, and it keeps getting colder and colder until it comes to the ozone layer. The ozone absorbs the sun's energy and warms up the layer. Um, and here is the temperature at 19 kilometres, and here's the global total ozone. This is the time series I showed you earlier. So you can see about 1979, that was when it was realised that the ozone is decreasing. And here's the ozone. This is the missing ozone. Where is the ozone going? Well, you can see at the same time the temperature was decreasing, but they're certainly not related. They're quite different time series. 
And you can see that the ozone didn't just plummet. It didn't just go down as we started using chlorofluorocarbons. There's a lot of variability in here. And what's more, it seems to have started to recover. Now, remember, we had the Montreal Protocol that banned the use of chlorofluorocarbons. And so we're interested to know how much of this recovery is because this policy has been successfully implemented. So to, to do that, what I want to show you is an explanation for the variations in these different time series. Um, as I mentioned, volcanoes have a big impact on the temperature. Volcanoes actually cool the stratosphere, I mean, warm the stratosphere, cool the troposphere, and you can see that in this time series here. Big, these big spikes in temperature relate to the volcanic um, eruptions, decreases in ozone as well, internal oscillations, in this case called a quasi-biennial oscillation, Think of it as just like a sloshing around of the stratosphere near the equator. But interestingly enough here, here is the solar cycle in temperature. Now remember in the upper atmosphere in space weather, the solar cycle variation was almost a factor of two, very big. Here we're talking um, in temperature of um, maybe four-tenths of a Kelvin globally. This is globally. So much smaller, but still distinct. And also a solar cycle in ozone, which is what you expect, um, because um, the UV radiation creates ozone. In fact, interestingly enough, it's these beautiful measurements from space that have allowed us to come to this sort of attribution study. Because when I started working on ozone before this measurement, there was um, a paper produced actually by another Australian. It was called Suggest um, Exercise in Autocorrelation Suggestions, something saying that anyone who even dared to suggest there was a relationship between the sun and ozone must be crazy because there simply wasn't. Well, he, he didn't have enough data. So now we have this beautiful data and you can see there's not an obvious solar cycle in there, but once you start taking into account all the other things, you can see there is a solar cycle. And is the ozone recovering now partly because of the solar cycle increasing here? A little bit, it's true. Um, but other things probably dominate these records and they're man-made gases. And I've talked about the chlorofluorocarbons and here, this component here shows you how much the chlorofluorocarbons decreased um, the temperature and the ozone, here's the ozone record, until the Montreal Protocol. So now the Montreal Protocol is causing the ozone to recover. The solar cycle is having an effect. And now what I've shown here are greenhouse gases. So you might say, what have greenhouse gases got to do with ozone? Well, all of this entire system that I'm talking about is intimately coupled. The greenhouse gases are emitted from the surface. And I'll show you in the next part when I talk about climate that they're causing the surface to warm. But they drift up into the stratosphere. They radiate to space. There's not much atmosphere above them. So they actually cool the stratosphere. So the greenhouse gases alter the atmosphere, the temperature and the dynamics, and actually affect ozone as well. So ozone isn't just varying because of the chlorofluorocarbons, but also because of the greenhouse gases. And here's an example of that. Radiative and chemically, the greenhouse gases change the temperature, and so that changes the catalytic reactions. A lot of the ozone reactions are temperature dependent. But interestingly, and this is a really fascinating thing, the greenhouse gases warm the surface. And so what that does is increase the dynamics that moves gases from the surface near the equator, and this is just showing you the, the equator, the transport of gases up into the stratosphere. In particular, the, remember I showed you that the ozone was less at the troposphere, so if you're moving more ozone from the troposphere up to the stratosphere, then that um, affects the ozone in altering the circulation patterns. So the system's much more complicated than just, well, we have CFCs and we have the sun. We have all these things too. So this now brings me to climate. Um, so we're going down, down, and we're getting into, we're going down in altitude, we're going um, up in, let's see, no, we're going down in the sun's influence, and we're going up in um, the uncertainty of the attribution, because climate change, as you know, is very, um, it's very debated. Um, and in fact, I like these two view graphs, because whenever you see a, a comic about the poor old earth wilting, um, what's wrong with the earth? The sun is always in there, sort of smirking away somehow. Um, the sun, for some people, 
is really a wild card because if they can show, if they believe that the sun is causing the climate to change, then, you know, there's no way Congress can regulate the sun, you know, forget it. But if they... But if the sun isn't causing it to change, then that's a whole different issue. So what I want to do now is go through and parse out the things that, that, that the analysis that I'll show you um, says or suggests the reasons climate is changing. Now, this is to give you a, pers a broader perspective, and that is that climate, the surface temperature where we live, has always been changing. And this is the record since 1850. It's what we call the instrumental record, uh, because it's made from basically ground-based instruments. And in the first few slides, I just showed you this uh, last 20 or so years. And a couple of things to note. The change from 1900, in other words, the first part of the 20th century, there was warming. But the pattern of warming was quite different than the pattern in the last half of the century, which implies different things are causing this warming, not just, um, for example, greenhouse gases. If you put that in this um, 150 years in the broader perspective of the last 1,000 years, and this is, this is what Mike, the work Mike Mann did, and you've probably heard of um, reference to the hockey stick. So this is the hockey stick. Basically, it says that for almost 800 years, the temperature, the global surface temperature of the Earth decreased slowly but was sort of essentially steady. And these wiggles that you see in here are sort of the effect of volcanoes and solar cycles. But then in the last 150 years, it's increased dramatically. So this is the hockey stick. But if we go back even further, this 1,000 years here is just the last um, 1,000 years of what we refer to as the current warm period, the Holocene. So this is this is now giving this, this context of the warming in the last 150 years in the terms of the entire Holocene. Now, the Holocene is um, the re it's, it's our period where the Earth has been warm enough to um, host humans, basically. Agriculture commenced about 10,000 years ago. And there's actually some theory by Bill Rudderman, which I think is really neat, that as soon as humans started um, burning things and causing fire then that was the, the um, initial anthropogenic era at that point, and we've just been accelerating since then. But anyway, so this is the last interglacial epoch, and you can see even by comparison, the warming since then has been dramatic. So, um, again, the local newspaper gets delivered every door to ours. So not that I ever get to read it before my husband, but um, there are lots of articles about um, by politicians about like overheated rhetoric on climate change doesn't make for good policies. And pointed out, contrary to model projections, data released, this is this October, University of East Anglia, show that the global temperature has held steady over the past um, 20, I can't read that, 15 years, despite rising greenhouse gases. Now, this is common in the media, and here's another one in US Today earlier, the fact that global temperature trend has been stable. And the sense of all this is called the pause now amongst climatologists because in the last 15 years, the global surface temperature record has actually been constant. And if greenhouse gases have been going up, then why has the, the temperature been constant? The inference from articles like this is that the two are not related. In other words, this quote proves that greenhouse gases are not causing climate change because climate isn't warming, even though greenhouse gases are. And in fact, um, another Washington Post article, I really like this one because this candidate, I, I think he was actually elected, he says, well, I believe it's just sunspots. I really like this one. So the, the idea of the sun playing a role in climate change, because you know, it's the sun that he ever gets up, we get up in the morning, the sun rises, the sun sets. It's a completely different thing than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how changes in the sun affect changes in the earth, not the diurnal changes. And in fact, if you look on, there's so much stuff on the web about the sun. And this, it's the sun, stupid. You can actually buy T-shirts, you know, it's the sun, stupid. And there's claims that the sun could account for as much, almost 70% of the increase in Earth's average temperature. Now, the reason for this is the following. I showed you, or here it is again, the surface temperature record in the past 150 years, and you can see it's been going up. 
If you look at the record of solar activity indicated by the sunspot number, I showed you that earlier in the timescales of solar variability, here it is going up. And in, the little, in this period here, which coincided with what we call the little ice age on Earth, the sun actually was in a minimum, a broad, a more, it's called the Mourner Minimum. And this was actually when Galileo first sighted sunspots and it was such an event that every time anyone saw a sunspot on the sun, they would publish a paper on it because that was such a rare event. So where we are now is in a period of high solar activity. And the argument is that it's this increase in the overall activity of the sun that has been causing this warming. So what I want to sort of go through now is how credible is that and how does the sun factor in with all the other things that cause climate to change? There's no doubt that the sun is the source of Earth's energy. And it's the, as I said at the beginning of my talk, it's the incoming energy from the sun, a visible radiation that heats the Earth and then the, it gets reflected and absorbed in the atmosphere. It heats the atmosphere. There's a whole myriad of processes that go on which ends up in the Earth radiating to space and the net effect of the sun plus the greenhouse gases that trap some of this infrared radiation is that we, Earth, we're in the Goldilocks zone. It's just right. But you can see if you change any of these things, if you change the incoming energy from the sun, the composition of the atmosphere, in other words, that trap the infrared radiation, the um, clouds, the aerosols, any of these things, you can cause this balance, this radiative balance to change with the result that the temperature has to change to adjust. So this is to remind you there are many causes of climate change. I've talked about solar variability and I'll go through the natural forcings by the sun and by volcanic eruptions. The anthropogenic gases, it's not just CO2, but there are other, quote, greenhouse gases. In other words, greenhouse because they trap that infrared radiation emitted by the Earth's surface, methane, CFCs, etc. There's a, uh, it's not exactly a wild card, but in addition to greenhouse gases, um, in the industrial activity is also producing aerosols. Aer I talked about volcanic aerosols. They are aerosols that get into the stratosphere. What I'm talking about here are low-altitude aerosols emitted from factories um, like um, soot, sulfate, carbon, and they affect the climate directly because they, it's like they put a blanket across the earth and so affect the incoming radiation. So it, that's a direct effect. But there's also an indirect effect because the aerosols themselves can provide the nuclei for cloud formation. And the clouds are very much um, an amplification factor of, of the climate on Earth. So if the cloud droplets are smaller or there are more or fewer of them, this is related to the aerosols. So the, this whole issue is very complicated. And then we have things like land cover changes. If we change the distribution of um, the surface features, we're changing the albedo. So we're changing the amount of radiation that, that gets reflected versus absorbed. And in addition to that, the Earth itself has internal oscillations because it's sloshing around. The dynamical motions um, are causing things to change. And, and you're probably most, especially here in California, with the El Nino Southern Oscillation. In fact, at one point, probably 10 years ago, anything that happened in climate or in the weather or, you know, on timescales of years, was, ah, it must be El Nino, it must be El Nino. And it's certainly true, and I'll show you the time series, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, in, by which I mean El Nino and La Nina, this cycle, affects the global temperature. But there are other oscillations as well. In the East, whenever we hear the meteorologists say, they say, oh, we're in the positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. So that's another oscillation, and then the quasi biennial Oscillation. So um, I talked about the sun's irradiance. I talked about the ultraviolet and the extreme ultraviolet radiation being important for the upper atmosphere. What we care about for climate is the total solar irradiance. We don't care about the sunspot number because that's just sunspots. We care about the changing amount of photons that reaches the Earth. And the two things affect those, two primary things affect that. Um, one, in fact, is sunspots. Now, interestingly enough, when there are sunspots on the sun's disk, like especially at solar maximum, like we're just heading, we're around solar maximum now and every 11 years it's maximum. 
But it, you can imagine like a light bulb, if you, put, if you black out a bit of it, you'll get less light. So the sunspots actually decrease the radiation from the sun. And this, this curve here shows how the sunspots decrease the energy from the sun in the, with this 11-year cycle. But there are other things on the sun called faculae, um, or they're called plage. I think faculae means the torch in Latin or something. Anyway, these bright regions are also part of the sun's activity cycle, and you can see them here. And in fact, originally, because you could only see sunspots, everyone said, well, the, so, the, to, the sun's total brightness must be out of phase with solar activity because there are more sunspots, they decrease the radiation, so the brightness should be, be lower. But that's not true because, in fact, the bright regions out produce almost twice as much brightness as the dark regions, the sunspots, darken the sun. So, in fact, the total solar irradiance is higher when solar irradiance is higher. This number is a tenth of a percent. And this has led people mistakenly to think, the sun only varies by a tenth of a percent. Why do I care? The sun has so much energy that a tenth of a percent of the sun's energy change from the minimum to the maximum cycle equals the radiative forcing by greenhouse gas growth over that time period. Now, there's a distinction here between radiative forcing, in other words, the change coming into the system, and the climate response. The climate tends to respond much more with much less um, sensitivity to a cycling time series like this than it does to greenhouse gases, which are continually going up. So this is sort of to get, give you a sense that it's the changing of the forcings that's important, but also of the response. But the, anyway, so this is how the sun is varied. Now, you might think, wow, that's a really noisy data set. It isn't. This is a beautiful, precise data set, and this is a big sunspot. This is, the this is the decrease due to sunspots. So that's the irradiance. Volcanoes I talked about earlier in the context of the stratosphere at 20 kilometres, but at zero kilometres, a, a big volcanic, volcanic um, eruption literally puts lots of um, aerosols into the atmosphere and it cools the climate. And you can see for a couple of years a decrease in the global surface temperature, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, now, anthropogenic influence is that, as I said, it's not just all greenhouse gases, but greenhouse gases shown here is the biggest um, factor that's been increasing over the last 100 or so years from a variety of sources. I really like this way, agriculture. But also, you know, there's a whole variety of things that produce greenhouse gases. And there are a whole variety of things also that produce these tropospheric aerosols that I talked about these um, microscopic, microscopic particles. Um, so really the interplay in the sense of the anthropogenic effects on the Earth's surface and the temperature effect is basically this competition between the increasing greenhouse gases which are producing a warming and also as a result of industry, the increasing aerosols, including their indirect effect, which is very uncertain, which is producing cooling. So one of the things that climate models do, for example, is, um, and the members of the committee up there, can you please ignore this? They don't like me talking about twiddling knobs, but <laughs> they literally do, the climate models literally do, or they can change these knobs in their simulations to get like just the right answer. But in reality, this indir indirect effect is very uncertain. And if it was large, then it could be masking warming that is yet to happen, like let's so we clean up the um, soot from the atmosphere, that could mean that we actually have more greenhouse warming. And this is just to illustrate how complicated this whole problem is. And then it's even more complicated because, as I said, we have things like the Nino Southern Oscillation. And I guess in California, what you think of it as is, is you know, is it warm water or cold water? When there's um, an El Nino, this um, warm pool in the Western Pacific sort of sloshes, oh, um, sorry, that's not it, here, sloshes over to um, the West Coast of America. And El Nino isn't just the Pacific surface temperature. It's actually a complex interaction between an atmospheric um, circulation pattern that extends up to the lower stratosphere and um, a circulation pattern in the mixed layer of the ocean. And so... We can't really forecast El Nino, but we know that it sloshes around and it alters conditions everywhere on the globe. 
and you can actually see it in the global surface temperature record. So now having given you those sort of basic things that we believe are affecting, affecting the surface climate, including the sun, what I'm going to do now is show you from 1980 to the present. This is the global surface temperature record. It's the record that I showed you at the very beginning of my talk, saying, you know, how and why does this vary? And here is the period of the pause. I think I have that highlight. Yeah. This is what all those um, Washington Post articles were talking about. Why hasn't the temperature gone, been increasing when greenhouse gases have been increasing? So this orange curve through here, which I think is, is a pretty good fit, actually. It's just a statistical fit to the data, but it combines the El Nino Southern Oscillation time series. And you can remember there was a super ENSO in 1997 um, shown here, and that's what produced this global, global warming of a few tenths of a degree. So part of the reason why the temperature in the last 15 years is lower than in 1979 has nothing to do with greenhouse gases. It's because we had a super El, um, El Nino in this period which raised the temperature. If we look back, there was also an equally strong El Nino almost in 1982. But now, if we factor in the volcanic aerosols, this was Pinatubo and this was El Chichon. And you can see the El Chichon volcano coincided with this El Nino and they cancelled each other out in the surface temperature record. So you wouldn't, if you were looking, you know, well, this seems normal. But really it wasn't. It was this competition of these two things. And so much of this sort of um, year to decadal variability is due to these, these factors, the volcanic aerosols and ENSO. The greenhouse gases have continued to increase throughout this period, but they've been counted in this recent period by the fact that we've been primarily in a La Nina condition. We haven't had a big El Nino in the last decade. And at the same time, we've been on the descending phase of the sun cycle, which amounts for maybe a tenth of a degree centigrade. So if you add up these natural things, you can actually explain fairly well this record. In other words, the greenhouse gases have been continuing to warm the planet, but we just don't have a long enough record for this signal to emerge from this variability of a few tenths of a degree due to these other things. And more importantly, um, I'm sure everyone here in fact, I do it myself. Oh, my God, it's been so cold in Washington. It must be, you know, there's no global warming. And the politicians love to say that, too. They always have hearings in Congress in the middle of winter when it's a really cold winter, and it's like, how can you say there's global warming? So this explains that. Each of these factors has its own regional signal. So if you were in a period of um, this big super ENSO and you lived where you do uh, on the western coast of the US, you would see more warming than, than the rest of the country. But if you lived here and there was a volcanic um, eruption, you would experience cooling, but it would be because of the volcano, not because the lack of global warming. And th this is a similar patterns for the sun and for greenhouse gases. So it's very important to know that these, all of these things have their own regional signatures. They also have seasonal signatures. So when we talk about climate change, we must, own, and, and the IPCC made this point, we need to talk about multi-decades and not just local and regional um, aspects. Now, as for the issue of did the sun cause the recent, the warming over the last 150 years, we can answer that in a similar way. Basically, what I've done here is taken those components that I showed you in the previous slide. Here's the global surface temperature record now. I just showed you the last 30 years. Here's the whole instrumental record. The green curve shows the combination of all these things. This is the Alinea Southern Oscillation. You see it has big ups and downs, but it doesn't really have a trend. So we can't say that trends in ENSO have caused this warming. We've had volcanic aerosols, but the trend in that hasn't been enough um, to cause, or the lack of, I guess, to, to affect this. As far as we know from the sun's uh, long-term activity, and this is uncertain, but these are the solar cycles that I showed you that we've measured. We believe that on the longer time scales, um, there may be slightly more variability than that, but certainly not enough to account for 70% of the warming. The only thing left out of those um, components that I showed you explain the current record so well 
is the um, anthropogenic gases. And so by this analysis, the natural variability, including by the sun, might account for less than 15% or so of the warming in recent times, but the greenhouse gases are likely the cause of at least 80% of it. So that's the synopsis of where we are from the measurements that we have. Now I want to move on to the last part of my talk, which is forecasting. And, um, and some of the work I'm going to show you, I did with my colleague, David Ryan at GIS. And when we first um, talked about um, a forecast of the global surface temperature, one of the bloggers said, you have to be really stupid or really brave to forecast climate. So whether it's stupid or what, I'm going to show you some forecast. And you might again say, well, you know, why am I showing the Navy? Well, when I first joined the Navy, which was at least 20 years ago, the Navy had no interest in climate change whatsoever. All it cared about was its, its mission and what was the weather at the mission. But in 2010, the Navy um, organised, whenever they have a problem, they have a task force. So they have task force climate change because the Navy recognises that to operate in this world efficiently, it has to know the environment from the surface to space and how it's changing. And one of the things, of course, that the Navy's interested in is what's going to happen in the next uh, maybe decade. I mean, they need to know longer too. For example, if you put, try and build a submarine, it takes a lot of planning, decades. But in particular, they're very interested in what's happening to the Arctic sea ice because to the extent that that is melting, then the Navy wants to know about it. So... The, um, the forcing or the future um, climate is very interesting to a lot of people. So here's this projection that is um, <laughs> maybe stupid, we'll see. But it is a, a projection. It's just to give you an example of if you say that I can understand the current climate record in terms of these things, and in fact this is very much an assumption that what happened in the past will influence the future, which is a big assumption, but let's say that the greenhouse gases continue, the sun keeps cycling on, basically what's going to happen is the earth's going to keep warming, but it won't necessarily um, warm in a linear way. There'll be these modest changes due to the sun, and here are the patterns that you expect in um, 2014. But if we have, as these dash curves indicate, um, so let's say we have a big volcano followed by a big ENSO, then the pattern for the future would be something like this, and you can see this big warming, and you can, or followed by, if we have a big cooling and then a big warming, you can see, you can imagine the politicians saying, look, over five years the globe has warmed this much. We must be having accelerated global warming. But it wouldn't be the case at all. It would just be this combination of the natural factors. So it's really important in the future, certainly in the immediate future, to understand how these things are affecting climate. And in the future, we expect that, um, that the sun will continue to play a role, but greenhouse gases will play more of a role. So the sun, as I said, likes to be thought of as a wild card by everyone. And so th there's been a debate in the last maybe five years, of, is the sun fading? What if the sun goes into a Monde minimum, right? And um, part of the reason for this is we've just come out of a very long minimum. The last minimum was a year or so longer than we would have thought. And this led to, this is only, it's not that far long ago, it's only a couple of years ago, major news, sun's fading spots signal big drop in solar activity. Well, this was before the present cycle started up. You will be pleased to know the sun still hasn't a cycle and it came back, despite what this announcement said. But this, of course, led to a zillion blog things about, well, if the sun goes into a little ice age, will this bring, will this counter greenhouse gases? You know, can the sun save us? And just to remind you, I showed you the sunspot number earlier and how this period of the morning minimum which is from like 1650 to 1700, um, like the Thames River froze over, there were hardly any sunspots on the disk. It was a period of enormously low solar activity and it did coincide with um, the coldest parts of the Little Ice Age. So if we have a Little Ice Age, is that going to save us? Um, and in fact, again, from the Washington Post, they have this great group called the Capital Weather Get. Okay. Could a quiet sun catch a global warming? And this was just the last year. Okay, so the answer, the, the answer is no. Okay, so here's why. 
I showed you this forecast going forward and I showed you this little sort of little um, wobble here, this wiggle, is the sun's role. If the sun's irradiance, remember we're not talking about sunspots or solar activity, we're talking about the brightness. We have to know what that is. If it decreased by one solar cycle, in other words, a tenth of a percent, the thing that produces a tenth of a degree wobble in the temperature record, it would bring the temperature in 2030 to here. Even if the sun's brightness decreased by a factor of five more than we've seen, it, which by all accounts is entirely unlikely, it would still only cool the globe in 2030 back to where we are now. So the sun, if, a, if for some reason I went into this massive morning minimum, which we don't believe it will, and decreased the irradiance by that amount, it still wouldn't counter most of the warming over the century. And that's because, um, because there's just not enough energy there to counter the greenhouse gases. And furthermore, I'd like to add this as well, just to remind you, or well, this is just um, showing the sun's activity in time. The Maunder minimum, and this is a proxy which I won't go into, it's just it's carbon-14, which is a way of getting the long-term activity of the sun. But, it, but it's interesting in the following regard. The Maunder minimum is one of three or four recent minima of the sun. So historically, over the past 10,000 or so years, we've had about a cluster of five minima. These clusters of minima tend to come every 24,000 years. So we've had one, so the probability that we'll have another is low for another 2,500 years. So anyway, so don't count on the sun to save us. Now, this is, this is um, actually, it's getting to be my final slide. Oh, my goodness. So, I was meant to have 10 minutes for talk, but we have three minutes. But um, for a question, sorry. I want, to, I want to point this out because I did show you that the ozone layer, we, you know, we think of it, it's dominated by, it's being destroyed by chloro, fluorocarbons. Where's it gone? We think it's coming back because of the Montreal Protocol. But there's this other thing now, which is greenhouse gases. So when will the ozone layer recover? Has it recovered yet? And what will it do in the future? So here's a time series I showed you the time series of the global total ozone here. This is a projection going forward of solar cycles and these two components now. The, the, the fact that the chlorofluorocarbons um, are being phased out, so the ozone will be recovering as a result of that. But it will also globally be increasing because of greenhouse gases. So we could be in the position that by um, the end of the century, we'll have more ozone than we had before the CFC depletion. In other words, we won't be worrying about, are we getting skin cancer anymore? We'll be worrying about, do we have enough vitamin D and are we getting rickets? <laughs> Which is, it goes to show that this whole system is so interconnected that when we do one thing, other things are affected. Now, this is... Um, this is, of course, controversial, but it, it's basically the sense of the latest um, WMO report, and it's because, as I said, the greenhouse gases affect the temperature and the dynamics. So, um, in summary, suspended in a sunbeam, this is where we are, and, and the sun gives us energy, and, and it's beautiful, and it changes, and we need to know that. It drives changes throughout the Earth's extended operational environment, but it doesn't you can see those changes dominating the space environment when we come down to ozone and especially to the climate. It's a, a, a minor player, but it's still there. Um, other things are by far more dominant. In the future, we can expect solar influences to dominate the thermosphere on the atmosphere and space environment for the foreseeable future. But in terms of as we go through the next decades, the anthropogenic inf influences will become increasingly dominant um, over the solar influences. And, um, and this is the part of the, the committee work that we're doing here this week. We have to monitor and model this environment and we have to have the measurements um, to observe how the system's uh, working. We have to have them stable and we're debating about stability and priorities and databases. But we can't hope to understand the system unless we, unless we can observe it and model it. So, thank you.